Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everybody. And I'm really happy to be here with you all together, remotely here from Singapore. And what I wanted to talk to you today about was sustainability and innovation in, in the fragrance industry in a post-COVID world. So take you through five chapters here. Initially, early days, living with the virus, a more sustainable world and how it's going to come about. How do we need to change the ways of working in our business? And eventually, talk a little bit about the Asian decade. So the early days, as you all know, was, was in the city of Wuhan. It's almost a year and three months ago that it actually started and spread out pretty rapidly to different parts of the world. And you often hear that it started with, with the bats. Some say bats, some say pangolins, a mixture of the two. But here's a picture of a bat market in Indonesia. And there are over 1,400 varieties of bats, I believe. And you find bat markets like this in many parts of Southeast Asia, especially around the Golden Triangle, where a lot of the heroin used to come from. China recovered pretty quickly economically from this from the virus situation. And within three to four months, you could already see that flights were coming up slightly, consumers were back in the market, but traffic from the ports and the production and exports was back to normal in three to four months. Unfortunately, it was not the same for, for the West. Uh, most affected, of course, were countries like Spain, Britain, France, Italy. United States, where there was a lot of noise around the virus, but suffered less economically, but all the countries suffered enormously through the loss of life, which has been most unfortunate over the past one year. How has this affected changes in consumer behavior overall? I think the first thing has been that you've seen a cutback on luxury. So you've seen a situation where no flights, duty-free shops, are closed down, and sales of fine fragrance perfumes fell 25, 30, 35 percent, especially in the first few months, and continues to fall as there is very little traffic in duty free. I think in the rest it's recovered to some extent. In China, they say it's recovered. Luxury overall has recovered quite a lot, and a huge effervescence, effervescence may be expected later on in the course of this year as the whole situation becomes better and people may be suddenly begin to splurge as did happen after the pandemic of over a, se of a century ago. I think on the other side, unfortunately, over 300 million people have been pushed back into abject poverty. And I think this is going to take quite some time to recover and the sooner that you have the vaccine and people vaccinated, you'll be in a better situation. Stockpiling was a big issue in early days. You know, all over everything disappeared and little was found in markets at all. From a physical and mental point of view, we've seen this always. The question of masks, sanitizers, a lot of solidarity amongst people. I was always amazed to see people coming out of their houses into the balconies all over, banging plates, singing, uh, singing to one another. It made for, you know, uh, quite a remarkable situation. On the other side, borders closed completely. And in fact, even where we are here in Singapore today, to contain the virus, people don't travel out at all. And if you do travel, you're subject to strong restrictions. The interesting to see the interesting thing to see in some aspects was that you, everything came more and more onto the net. And I was amazed to see in, in a country like India that Amazon actually decided that in each sort of neighborhood, they would put some of the neighborhood shops back on, uh, on Amazon so you could pick up food from your own neighborhood. And people who had never visited some of these places before suddenly began to discover new places. And in addition to that, you discovered that your baker next door or people who started independent kind of businesses suddenly began to run something which was somewhat better overall. 
you reinvented the way you lived. Yeah. I think working from the home has become the norm. It's become de rigueur over the last over the last year or so. People cook much more. You did more bricolage maintenance in your house all the time. E-commerce has just grown exponentially over, over the last year or so, and everybody spends much more time on social media, not only with family, with friends, with old school friends, I discover old university friends, but at the same time, there's been a huge amount of isolation of people, especially of people who live singly and who can't get out that much, or people who are old and who are ill. And then you have the the normal sort of scenario where if you live in a relatively small place, people are jockeying for space to be able to do their video calls, the dog is barking in the background, you have small children who, may, you know, who are crying, so all this has to be managed and ends up being pretty stressful a lot of the, a lot of the time. I think in all the panic buying, what I saw was that, and I saw the slide about pantries of panic, and the single thing that grew enormously was oat milk, given more than masks or all kinds of masks. And net result was I started you know, on oat milk and have continued ever since that I saw this slide about a year ago or so. On the other side, I think when you look at the whole sustainability situation, you're in a situation today where consumption is straining the planet enormously. And it comes in all kinds of varieties. You look at the first thing, you look at mining and extraction. So historically, everything comes, a lot of what we do comes from oil. If it doesn't come from oil, it comes from metals. So all the kind of equipment we have in this room today takes a lot of metal into it. And a lot of the metal are newer kind of metals, uh, lithium, platinum, everything like that, that is used in all the electronic systems. I think there's a huge pressure on land for food, for plants, for water, and the whole thing about, you know, the resource of animals, and which I talked about, you know, two years ago when I spoke at, at, the, at the last IFRA meeting and talked about the 15,000, you know, uh, liters of water that's needed for a kilo of, of beef, half of that for a kilo of lamb, and and half of that for a kilo of, of, uh, of, of chicken. And then I compare it to a shower where you use 55 liters of water and where I complain to my son every day about the long showers that he takes. He could literally take a, a year of showers for the kilo of beef that he would eat over a period of time. So consumption is, is, is huge. And our resources are not being, going to be able to support this at all. And when you look at the amount of greenhouse gases that there are all around the world, and you compare the five meat companies, the five meat companies basically generate as much greenhouse gas as the leading, leading petroleum companies in the world today. So this will have to change over a period of time and you really need to see how this is going to take place. I've been involved over the last few years in a, in a biotech business based out of Boston, and I see that over the last couple of years, there are more and more biotech businesses that, that have started around the world, some of them beginning to do quite well. This has always been extremely strong in the pharma business for the last 20 years or so, but it's going to expand and it's inevitable that will expand in the chemical business over, over, the next, over the next 20 years or so. And while it starts maybe with expensive chemicals and it starts maybe with, to a certain extent in flavor and fragrances, I would expect that over a period of time, this will expand into all the cheaper chemicals that are going to be needed to be substituted by more sustainable means. And I will come back to this as I go through my presentation a little more. But I think one of the most important things to see is this. This is a slide which shows you how climate is going to change over the next 20 to 30 years or so. And if you see the whole red belt there in the middle of this slide, 
this is going to be, this is the area that's going to be most affected. And when you look at the impact that it's going to have on China, the impact it's going to have on India, and the impact it's going to have on parts of Africa down into Madagascar, all regions which are extremely important for the flavor and fragrance industry. If you see the, you know, the IFRA, IFRA work that, we do, that we've done on the value of the fragrance industry overall, you can see the employment, the importance of employment in China and India for our industry. And if this is going to be affected really badly, it has a major, major impact on what we're doing. I remember saying to an aunt of mine who, lived in, who lives in Canada and saying to her about 15 years ago, where when she was complaining about the huge amount of immigration coming into the country, and I said, watch it and you'll see in 15, 20 years, a lot of the north of your country is going to turn out being a lot more temperate and your population may move over a period of time from 30 million to 300 million. I said it more in jest at that point in time, but you know, these kind of scenarios of seeing large moves in migration of populations, especially into the north of the northern hemisphere, is going to be a distinct possibility in the years to come. So let's see what impact this has had on the pine fragrance business. Clearly, you have much less customer contact because none of you all are traveling anywhere. Some of you all are very happy about this. You know, I, for one, I used to travel almost 200 days a year at its peak. Uh, it's been a blessing not to have traveled for, at all over the last one year or so. You do less travel, but I think the other thing that's happening is a lot of brands are going much more local. So when I see in the past that people talked about having global fragrances all around the world, and today within a particular country, you want different fragrances for different regions, I think it's really taking you back to the other extreme, which used to exist over 20, 25. 25 years ago, in the early days of my being in this industry overall. The other thing is, you know, you can't evaluate, you can't go to your lab, you can't smell laundry, you can't smell things like this. So there is going to be a very different kind of way of working. And you'll need to use different kinds of creation tools also at the same time. I've been hugely impressed with, you know, with some of the things that have come through through in Givadon over the last couple of years. And there's just one that I'll show you, which is something called Kato which is what a perfumer can use online to be able to, to use certain data that has been put together through AI and, and historical data that exists in the company to be able to support create perfume, perfumer creativity and be able to see your samples and smell them almost immediately after that. And I think more and more of these tools are going to be developed in the years to come in the future. And as you develop this tool, this tool can be an, you know, a very good way to start playing together with your customers to design product, to look at product that you do. You can, you know, you can look at all your ingredients also at the same time to develop a training system for people who want to study more about perfumery. And eventually, you can come to a situation where you can look at a product and purely by looking at the product, you can start seeing what, is, what, is, what does it smell of? What does it really smell like? So all these kinds of tools in the flavor and fragrance industry are going to develop through all the companies that are, that are very, very much present in, in our industry today. And the most important thing that I think is going to happen within our industry today is that over the next decade, I believe you will see a sea change in the materials that we use, in the palettes that we have, and the way that we approach the whole thing. Because you will need to have materials which are natural, which are biodegradable, and eventually you have to get to a situation of carbon neutrality. So if you look at fragrances, on one side you have ingredients, and the other side you have creation. So what you need to develop is a system where you have ingredients which are 
responsible ingredients in as much as basically the way they're sourced, the way they're manufactured, the way they're processed, and you've got to formulate with existing laws, with rules that are over there, which, is, which are going to change more and more over the years to come. And as you put this together, responsible ingredients will come through the way you grow your naturals, the upcycling that you're going to do more and more in the years to come, to be able to make byproducts out of, out of vetiver or out of, you know, out of lemongrass or anything like that and being able to reprocess them, biotechnologies that you have, and eventually biodegradable molecules. So I think this is going to be the sea change that's really going to happen in our industry around ingredients. And I think Unilever has captured this very well in their forward-looking approach, how they want to go completely to, to a sustainable, to a complete ingredient list, which is going to be completely renewable in the next 10 years. And that's a huge challenge, because when you look at it today, maybe close to 75% of what they use is all black carbon, which is basically non-renewable, oil-derived products like that. 25% or 30% maybe green carbon. Tomorrow it has to be a mixture of different things. Green, which is going to be a lot of bio, you know, either biorefineries, biotechnologies. Blue, which is all going to be from the sea and algae-related. Purple, which I think will be very much about, uh, you know, byproduct from steel plants, cement plants, where you have a huge amount of carbon dioxide, carbon monoxide, methane, to be able to use that overall. Brown, which is all about, about biomass at the same, same time, and how you're going to do that overall. Excuse me a second. Just moving on, so when you look at the, what's happening in the EU, EU today and what I read about, yeah, about the whole new move on chemicals and sustainability, what's going to happen is that I would think that where you have very large volumes of molecules that are based on black carbon, I think there's going to be a lot of pressure on them that we would either have to reduce them enormously or maybe eliminate them over a period of time. I would think more and more materials that have somewhat of a questionable safety profile, clients will ask that they be taken out and then you may end up disappearing. People are going to question the environmental profile of a lot of materials that we use, which today may look safe, but as more data comes out over a period of time, this is, going to be, this is going to be affected. And I think one of the most complex issues is going to be this whole approach of studying chemical mixtures more and more. And this whole belief that when you mix different things together, you get things which are completely different and has, you know, which can have different effects on the system. So this thing about medicines where you where you mix two medicines to get different kinds of effects. Does this happen in our business too at the same time? So I, I think these questions are going to come up more and more. And I think IFRA and the companies and everybody like that, you're going to have your hands full in dealing with this and the approach to all this just to ensure the safety, the safety of the ingredients that we use and the safety for our consumers. So, Will there be a, a sea change in the way chemicals are really made? And I was always of the view that, you know, when you took the equivalent of the car industry, I always thought that a Tesla would be acquired at some point in time and it would become part of, of GM or, or, you know, of uh, Ford or, or a big European company, Volkswagen or something like that. It seems Tesla's surviving very much on its own. And is there going to be a sea change, not in so much in the fragrance and flavor business, but in the whole chemical industry where are, there are going to be some new people who are going to come up 
and going to be somewhat different in this whole approach in their design of, of new chemicals that are needed to meet the green environment for the future. And will our materialists today, and you know, every year or every two years, we diligently do the volume of use survey, and then we always thought that volume of use survey had sort of plateaued, but it keeps creeping up and going higher and higher every couple of years. And it, maybe it's about 5,000 now, but is it going to suddenly narrow down as all this changes over the next decade? And by the end of the decade, are you going to be left with 500 materials that you use in perfumery? And if you can use only 500 materials and you have a huge amount of AI around this, is the beauty of our whole business model going to be affected very much and change drastically over the next 10 years? And I think this is what we need to be very aware about in whatever we do. The last few slides I wanted to talk to you a little bit and has relevance to IFRA and has relevance to regulation overall is, is about Asia. So, so clearly, I mean, when you look at it, Asia is, has been and will continue to be the fastest growing economy in the region and the world. And when you look at it post pre uh, COVID kind of situations, ASEAN is expected to grow 4.5% this year. China is expected to be back to growth of 8%. So is India expected. And the whole region would be, of Asia, would be at 7%. And by 2025, China is expected to be over one-fifth of the global economy overall. And just taking a very simple example of a subject that interests me hugely over the last 12 months, though I've never ever worked in the flavor or the food business overall, is, and I take the example in China where they say that in spite of the virus, in spite of the, uh, all the trade issues that they've had with the US, meat importation has doubled or increased by 85 or 90% during last year. And you see a huge plethora of brands today which are there in the alternate space. So on one side you have alternate proteins and you have a lot of alternate proteins on the market today which are basically made from plant sources, extracted, and then different additives made and finally you make it into a patty. Most of, the, most of these proteins smell pretty bad. So there's a huge, and taste pretty bad. So there's a huge amount of work for our flavor colleagues to be able to work in this area, to be able to, to make it taste much, much better. On the other side, you have all the cell, you know, the cell line meats which are slowly beginning to come out. They're pretty expensive today, but over a period of time, they're going to be much cheaper. And these are all made from single cells and you have companies like Memphis Meats and others that are, that are dealing in this area. Why do I speak about this? Because sitting here in Singapore today, I think Singapore is very much in the heart of all the work that is growing on, going on in this area. And the expectation that over, over the next few years and the plan of Singapore is that by 2030, they need to have be producing 30% of their food within, within the state only itself. So part of that, of course, is going to come to upscale, scale up urban production of food. So it's you know, really growing plants in urban spaces, on buildings, things like that, which is pretty complicated overall. But I think there's a huge biotech area in this about cell-based meat, microbial proteins, plant proteins, everything like that. And all this is embodied in something which is called FRESH, which is the Future Ready Food Safety Hub, which in, interestingly enough is headed by one of the people who was deeply involved in our industry uh, for a number of years, Ben Smith, who now heads this up over here, and Ben used to we used to be with the regulatory group in Furmanish in the US for many, many years. So clearly the whole idea over here is that try to develop regulation within the region and 
try to see how you can expand this globally to a certain extent. And I think this is embodied in the statement that I read and which I pulled out over here, where it said that not only would it allow first in market food products to be safely launched in Singapore, it could also enhance our local food regulatory capabilities and help promote Singapore develop food standards internationally. So, so the whole question, and when you look at this in IFRA and the situation that we face in certain countries and when we talk about all the testing that we do and the fact that most of our testing is done in Europe, most of our testing is done in the US, and we get all these questions, and what about on Asians, or what about on Latin Americans? And while I would think for a, a lot of the areas that we do, especially on, on toxicity and all, this is going to be universal wherever you do it, and I would expect on skin also, it's exactly, exactly the same, and that's what we've always propounded, but I think you're going to get a lot of pressures in countries about how do you deal with some of their own situations, especially in some of the bigger ones, like the situation that we've faced in India over the last couple of years. But I think as, as this develops in a different kind of way, I think we need to, all that we've started over the last few years of becoming a much more global organization needs to be enhanced to a much greater extent than we really are today. And I'd like to end with two, three things over here. And I think there were two, of all the reading that I've done over the, last, over the last year or so, there are a couple of quotes that I wanted to pick. And I think the first one is there for you to see, but I'd like to read it slowly. So the world continues its life, and it's beautiful. It has put humans in cages. It is sending us a message. You are not necessary. The air, the earth, the water, and sky without you are fine. Remember when you come back, you are my guests and not my masters. And the last slide that I have is a couple of quotes that I picked up from uh, uh, an article that Mark Cohn, uh, an op-ed that Mark, Mark Kenny, who was, who was the head of the governor of the, of, the, of the Bank of England wrote, again also about six, eight months ago, about how the economy must yield to human values. And I think it's hugely important that companies today are doing this more and more about putting purpose and putting uh, you know, sustainability at the head of the agenda. And he raised the question, what is more important to the world? Is it Amazon the forest or Amazon the country? If I ask this, ask my 17-year-old uh, kids two years ago on this, maybe they would have said Amazon the company. Today, I think it's clearly the forest, and, I'm, and I think there's a lot of hope with young people today. And the last thing is that, just remember when true climate, climate change comes, you have nowhere to self-isolate, actually. And I'd just like to end with a very short video. Uh, I showed one a year ago, or two years ago, and it's very much in the same line. Every neighbor is given a special front wheel. Once installed, it stores the energy generated while cycling and braking in batteries. And at the end of the day, when everyone comes back home and parks their bike, the energy is then redistributed into the neighborhood's electrical grid. Each day, Amsterdamers cycle two million kilometers altogether. As people pedal to work, to the gym, an average of 19.5 million watt hours is generated. This crazy amount of energy is already out there. Maybe we could simply bring it back home. Thank you very much. Wonderful being with all of you today and looking forward to continue to hear the rest of the day's program.